you supported the show, I'd be less sick of podcasts. You're America's <laughs> Sending out good vibes. 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 Underneath breaths of deep gratitude and prayers for guidance and protection. And put on a didgeridoo and shamanic drumming track. Shivers or vibrations and stuff like that. And I started also thinking that maybe it was really important that they have a certain number because one of the first things they did was replace the 12. Okay, guys, welcome back to the Grime America Show. Uh, We are going to be chatting with the one and only Lynn McTaggart a little bit later. Uh, I think we've been trying to get her on the show for about four years. (laughs) Pretty Finally much. got on. We had to get up at like fucking four in the morning to do it, but we did it. And it was a gooder. Would have been nice to go a little longer, but it was still good to get her on um, for sure. And of course, uh, before we get into that, we got the one and only Graham Ball Hockey Dunlop. How's it going, buddy? <laughs> in your time off request in there today, going to do some ball hockey. In. I might be. I don't know. We'll see. I'm kind of out of shape. Yeah, you better fucking get to it. I'm in the worst shape I've been in a while. Yeah, really. Yeah, I gotta get back into the, puffing up. Maybe I need, notice how I haven't done a biohacking segment for a while because I feel guilty. <laughs> You're bio slacking. My <laughs> <laughs> bio slack. <clears throat> so, other than slacking on your bio, what else you been doing? Uh, not much, you know. Usual researching, reading books. Yeah, I've been reading. Hanging out with the girlfriend, game. playing some D and D with the guys. That's been fun. Have you guys been squeezing in like uh, a lot of uh, extra D and D time? What do you mean? Have you guys been doing extra D and D, and are you guys doing that like three nights a week? No, 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 no. Sometimes, sometimes we just have a little practice and stuff. Practice, <laughs> just D&D. like C said. You know, it's just practice. Practice is half the fun. Yeah, it is. I do have, uh, I do have sort oh, I don't know if I can change this around now. Do you know how to rotate? Oh, there we go. I do have a follow-up to our, I think it was our last intro when I was talking about a, a, a buddy of mine on my ball hockey team getting ah, suspended, yes, the right? Slur. The suspension, yeah. 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 So what was so the well, verdict? We're, you know, some people were expecting negative feedback and stuff like that. I mean, I didn't get a lot of negative feedback. I think people well, understand got, you, we that got it was some pretty, negative feedback, but it wasn't about ball hockey. Or, or no, it wasn't slurs. about this. It was before this came out. That's right. So, anyways, I think our guy got suspended because he he called uh, called a guy, and it was a big fracas, and he called a guy a faggot a couple times, which is not good at all. So he got suspended. But you know, there's a lot of a lot of slurs thrown around in hockey. You know what it's like, Darren, in a semi contact sport, and it gets pretty competitive, and people get a little agitated, and you know. Oh yeah, yeah. Slurs I get fucking around. fired up when I'm playing. Oh, hockey, you do. Eh? Yeah, your elbows are fucking going oh, yeah. everywhere. I just like fucking go to the net, fucking crashing people. <laughs> so here's the rules. So it says a misconduct penalty shall be assessed to any player who shows any course of conduct, including threatening and abusive language or gestures or similar actions, designed to incite an opponent into incurring a penalty. Any player who removes his helmet to incite an opponent would also receive a misconduct under this rule. So that's just a general general uh, misconduct penalty rule. And then the, the next one is any player or team official who engages in verbal, verbal taunts, insults, or intimidation based on discriminatory grounds. So that fits right in. And then in brackets, <laughs> race, ethnicity. What's the next one? Religion, gender, sexual orientation. Boom. There it is. Doesn't, language. Doesn't say short language. fatness. So I know. That's my point. So you want more rules? Shall be assessed. I can't support no, more no, no, rules. no, 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 no. Shall be assessed a game misconduct penalty. Notwithstanding the above, at the discretion of the referee, a gross misconduct penalty may be assessed. Oh. 
So a gross misconduct may be assessed for any infraction to any player or team official. And it says, no, the officials must complete a game report and report to the president any penalty incurred under that rule. So I'm not asking for more rules. I'm just, I was just, I'm legitimately curious as to who decides that those are the only things that this, that are a problem. And I've got some interesting answers. I mean, you know, like, one of our listeners said that it's, it's, these are classes, right? They're, they're, they're segre they're um, identified as classes under, under hate speech. And, uh, you know, other, other friends of mine have said, well, you know, somebody calls me short. It's not as bad because I am short. And I was like, well, what if somebody calls me ugly or what if somebody calls me old, you know? Ageist. Well, no, age is, you'll get once you're, but you're not old enough to be that. Well, I've been yet. called old. Well, you're pretty old, but, but not, see, no, don't ten point years at me. Ago, don't I was point called at me. Old. Don't point at me. 10 years ago, I was called old in hockey, in ball hockey now, by see, a young team. There's like, no case. Oh, you bunch of old fuckers. There's no case. Like, there's no case. I, I know. I'm just, I'm just questioning. Well, I'm curious Even as now, to why. Once you're over 55, you get called old. Boom. Ageist. But what? Age was in there. No, it wasn't. No, it wasn't. Languages. I don't understand how language is in that bracket. Race, ethnicity. No, see you next Religion, Tuesdays. gender, sexual orientation, language. What does that mean? <laughs> oh, it must just mean swearing, like probably fuck or something. Or people that can't speak the language. Uh, like making fun of others' language, We need maybe? another breakdown. Maybe, like, we need a further breakdown. Making of fun of others' language? That's probably what it is. Yeah. Like faking an accent or whatever, mm -hmm. you know? I'm not going to do it here. I was close to doing it. And why aren't you going to fake an accent for the podcast? <laughs> oh, that was like a start as Australian like and went to something else. I'm not good with accents. I was so, doing someone the other day, though, and I was doing pretty good. So, uh, anyways, that's, there you have it. So, those those groups of things are in there and not old and fat and it's ugly and slow. <laughs> so, you're fucked. <laughs> I'm you're, good. You're I can't be discriminated against. You, well, you can. We can discriminate you all you want, but the government doesn't recognize it. Yeah. Which I'm okay with. They should recognize less. That's true. So I'm not advocating for more laws for sure. Just I'm just legitimately curious as to who's 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 playing God and gets to decide that <laughs> those aren't okay. Well, the government. That's right. Because those all fall into hate speech. That's right. Which will be broadened and broadened and broadened and broadened until you can't say it, criticize your leaders. You can't. Yeah, that's right. Or the state. Yeah. You heard it here first. Well, how long is that going to take? I don't know. We'll be we'll be fucking executed long before the listeners. Or yeah. co-opted. I'll just go along with the plan. I'll just be like, okay, guys, what do you want to say? No, I'm just kidding. We are the resistance. Not, but you think well, it'll be like five, ten years? Though? Really, though, five, ten years. Not, if if things don't resistance. change, if don't things don't us change, with the resistance. We're the resistance to the fucking MSM. <laughs> <laughs> Leave it at that. If things don't change, I mean, if things do change, no. What am I trying to say? If things don't change, we we might not be able to do this podcast soon. Or we'll just have to move to the states or to some other country. I think five, ten years. Things are going to shift either way. Is it going to go worse the other way or, or it's going to open up again? Yeah, I think it's tough to put the cork back on the bottle. It's going to be tough that's to the put the cork part. back yeah. on the bottle, especially yeah. on all this stuff that's going to be like, I don't know, we we almost could fall into art, artistic expression. Maybe. And I mean, something. I'm not for hate speech. Like I'm for free speech, but I don't condone hate speech necessarily. I think it's a curse. I really do think there's something metaphysical damaging about it. Just, That's I mean, speaking of soul. Lynn, I mean, we had Lynn McTaggart on this episode coming up later. Fantastic show. The power of eight, right? Showing evidence for the power of intention in groups and the rebound effect of the people that are sending those intentions are getting healing themselves and having, you know, experiences themselves. Is that why you wanted to talk about your little ball hockey thing so you could throw in a little rebound fucking analogy? No, but I do have a listener email to go with that. Do you want to play jingle? Does it have any F-bombs in it? I don't know, but you got to calm down on those too, buddy. No, I don't. Please. Sometimes in the intro, you, know you get a little bit. Your F-bombs are more offensive than mine because mine are just cuss words. Mine are well-timed. Your F-bombs are hate speech. Uh <laughs> <laughs> Is it a synchro or anything? Uh, yeah, kind of.
I want a good score from a synchronicity Brain reads it out, then Darren might give it to me Hey, don't you please read it low, yeah, yeah Okay, this is from, this is from Vance I've read the, oh, Darren's dropped something here I've read the first. my weed. I've, oh my god! Come on, this is an episode with Lynn. We don't have to get all weedy here. <laughs> There's a quote of the week. So, okay, go ahead. I read this first part of Vance when he got electrocuted on the scissor lift before, so I don't want to just reread that again. But I, I saved the last. Wait, part. what happened there again? His knee gave out. Yeah, yeah. To save him, actually. Did you read that on the podcast? Do you want me to quickly read it again? Give us a synopsis. Okay. Okay, he said uh, he was working with live electricity about 18 feet up on a scissor lift. For whatever reason, the installer didn't close his connectors, so the plates were exposed. It was a simple matter of closing them. No harm, no foul. These months, I was really anxious and struggling through panic attacks. I'd been mentally asking for life or life for a reset and energy boost. Be careful what you ask for, huh? I grabbed the bundle of wire to cinch it up. <laughs> And I started baking. He says, rewind a bit. It was weird because a few moments earlier, I had noticed a main connector that wasn't secured. Normally, I would have secured it. The conversation in my head decided to leave it. I don't know why, but left it alone. Back to this fat boy, Brian. The electricity isn't letting me go. 277 volts. But I felt I had some movement in right, my right side. Remembering the unsecured connector on the main and let my right knee give way. The main, main feet disconnected and I stopped frying. Moments later, I messaged a friend that shares an infrequent psychic or telepathic connection with me. And without hesitation, she laughed and said, guess you needed a reset. How's that working for you? The fuck? Yeah, I had been asking and I responded. Well, quit doing that with playing with electric, she responded and he had to laugh at it all. So then he says, just remember what happened last week. I was working in Dallas and I heard Lynn McTaggart mentioned in a podcast, decided to visit her website and learned about her newest book, The Power of Eight. I pre-ordered it on September 22nd. It was released on the 26th. On September 27th, my left pinky felt like I got a small cut under the nail. By the 26th, it was so swollen I could barely bend it. Whatever, I kept working. I began listening to her book on 1.5 speed. Dri during the drive home from work and towards the end of her book, I heard her say, if you are trying to heal the fourth finger on your left hand. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't, but what are the chances these events would coincide? Wait, what? And then he says, ask Big D to Wait, shoot. Wait, what? He wasn't. No, he wasn't trying to heal it. Right? Like it was bugging him, or maybe it was on his right hand. Not it pinky. Is the no, no, no. Finger. Yeah. Oh, it's fourth finger. Oh, fourth finger. It is the fourth finger. No. Oh, it is if you look at it that way. Depends on if you go f from the pinky up or from the index finger down, but you're right. It could be considered the fourth finger. So he's probably counting the thumb. Yeah. So he says, ask Big D to shoot me the black links. Not getting those. Love you guys. Oh, come on. So much, no matter, no, this is old. Oh, okay. he, he's got it. This is really okay. old. I've been saving it. <laughs> so much that no matter how broke I am, if there's any cash in the account, I send it, but not enough to be an overly attached fanboy. You don't have to worry about that at all. <laughs> so <clears throat> let me just read the rest of this email because he says, just received a message from Lynn on Facebook. She wrapped up the American attention healing experiment. Oh, hang on. Now, I think I have to read the other one first. This is the one I saved. So, Graham, there's something going on here that seems to be moving us towards embodying the full experiences of the human capacity and moving us away from merely conceptualizing or conspiring about what could be. So much that my Bible-believing, Pentecostal, tongue-talking pastor dad is opening up to what was relegated to the realms of mysticism, conspiracy, or New Age bullshit. I told him I had a message for his congregation. The poor guy grimaces every time. I used to speak for him and run the youth group groups the decades back. He politely declined. As life goes, I started, I attended his Wednesday night service. He was supposed to be working. Or no, I think was supposed to be working. Before the service, a little white-haired lady sat by me and began talking about 
the Bible alludes to what I know about God. There is so much more to this than our understanding of it. We were a small group sitting around tables, so everyone was listening. Out of respect to my family, I encouraged her to elaborate without going on an esoteric rant. She said, windows of time opened up to her, actually visually. I saw histories I shouldn't know about. Events and dresses and houses, everyday events, I could see them. She looked at me to see if I had mentally shut her out. (laughs) Jesus, man. You could see the longing for connection in her eyes. I leaned over, put a hand on her arm, grinned, and said, Seems the message I was given for my dad's church is meant for you. Consider what we call God as more a higher function of universal law and less a personality. (coughs) What you saw is within limits of this experience and not at all abnormal. Time is probably more fluid, nonlinear, and always now. So seeing and eventually traveling to these events is within our reach, right? You've always suspected this, right? She lit up like a white middle-class child from the 80s on Christmas. (laughs) Yeah, she sighed. Her mom was there, 98 years young. She chimes in. That child began reading the Bible and asking questions that stuffed most college-educated pastors. I told her I'd seen similar. I told her about downloads that led to work from Dr. Gerald Pollack, Marco Roden, Dan Winter, Thomas Geckler, and these two Canadians had introduced me to Dr. Ram. Who's Dr. Ram? Richard Allen Miller. Ah. He's probably talking about us, the two Canadians. And others who added context to my 9-11 prophetic dream and so on. Strange coincidence. If it wasn't for your podcast, I wouldn't have looked into McTaggart further. The following reply wouldn't have happened. From Lynn. Events. All I can say is, wow, thank you so much for detailed reporting on all your experiences. I'm so thrilled that this was life transforming. Your dad may be interested to know that many churches want to start the power of eight intention groups. Um, and then Mike High and Unity are already starting. I'm putting together a short handbook to help church groups get started. I'll announce it soon. Sign up for my website if you haven't already, and I'll be offering it. With a new community site, we hope to be up next week. That will help people set up virtual Power of Eight groups in their own time zones. Keep rocking in the free world. Vance. And then um, he says, I just got another message from Lynn on Facebook. She wrapped up the American Intention Experiment, and there are so many of what she calls rebound effects in my personal life, enough to be probabilistically significant. So anyways, yeah. Probabilistically? Um, Yeah. He said, he says, uh, I think, but what the hell do I know about numbers? That became way long. This became way longer than I expected. So anyways, thanks for the email, Vance. I've been saving that one up for a while because I knew that we were, I was intending to have Lynn on and it happened. There you go. Thanks, Vance. I think he's one of the Facebook guys. Oh yeah, probably. I know his name anyway. I've seen it around. I believe we've corresponded. (laughs) Probably. (laughs) Thanks for the email, Vance. I'm not going to rate your synchro. Why not? Okay. They'll probably message you, why didn't you rate All right, 7.7. That's good. Um, Speaking of free, show's free. Helps keep it that way by by supporting it. Um, Seriously, those guys, we got, what, 270 shows now. This will be 271, all free. If you're getting a little value from those shows, please do head over to grimerica.ca slash support. And sign up for a Patreon or a weekly or monthly or yearly or some sort of subscription. And it helps us uh, keep going and keep growing and keep the bills covered and, and you know, keep the keep plugging away. Um, we honestly couldn't do it. And we definitely couldn't be doing it uh, in the free, free-flowing, ad-free format that we do now if it wasn't for the few people that do choose to support the show, the less than 1% of you. We are still working on getting to 1%. And when... I mean, three, I'm not going to lie to you. When we get to 1%, I'm going to start fucking bugging you guys to get to 2% because it, we, I mean, come on. It's fucking should pathetic. be 3 to 5%. It should I be think. 3 to 5%. Yeah. Come on. Anyways. So if you're not signed up for a monthly, sign up for one today. It does really help, guys. It really does. Uh, if you don't mind, uh, of course, you can do one-time donations as well. And if you can't afford to support the show, we get that too. Uh, 
There's other ways yeah, to do it. Not check out the show notes. There's lots of other ways. A ton of different ways. The, the most important of which is to share the show. We have no marketing and we don't even know how to market if we did have marketing. We don't know. Well, you market on Twitter. I mean, that, well, that's Twitter all we, all we have is our social media. That, like, this is so. our little limited social media. Darren's reach, so. on Twitter. I'm on Instagram. Yeah. If you guys can compound that by sharing the show on social media or with your friends or wherever the fuck you can share the show, it really does help. You can also spam gram, send in your synchros, stuff like that. Sightings um, and experiences, yeah. strange experiences, whatever. We like Lucid to read dreams, it all. All that fun stuff. Just email the show. That's, that helps out big time. If you got any jingles or anything like that, send that along just as well. Don't forget about Sign the, up for uh, the newsletter. I still think there's only like 300 and some people sign up for the newsletter. Yeah. We can do better than that. Don't forget the... Uh, the main thing is we do have extra content as well. Even though we're putting out more of this extra free content, like five or six a month now, the we do have a black budget support feed and any single one-time or monthly donation. Obviously, we prefer monthly, but we'll give it to people for a one-time donation as well just to to be yeah, just because, Canadian. Just, be, just to be <laughs> Canadian. Yeah, and the black budget is, I think, slowly evolving into something great. And then, so Darren, so if you do that and Darren will, um, check to make sure that you don't have a link already and he'll send you one, I guess, manually. Yeah, every new subscriber or donator, subscriber? subscriber, fuck. Every new subscriber or donator, I send, just send a link as soon as I get the email. Oh, you know, they're new. Yeah. And if you, you sign up through the Patreon, it's auto, you get it. Patreon deals with it. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. Which is nice. Yeah. But they also take more. So, yeah, I mean, we, we honestly, we don't have a preference. We don't care how you support the show, as long as you support the show. Anyway, we're done talking about it. Yeah, thanks. Week. Thanks to everybody who's supported already. Yeah. So you were on a trip on the oh, weekend? Oh, yeah, I went out to the mountains, me and the wife. Yeah. And the missus. Yeah. A um, little romantic getaway. Yeah, my mom's in town. Actually, she's coming on the show later tonight. So she was able to watch the girls. So we fucked off out to Radium. Went out to Radium Invermere, stayed there, and then we... We drove the other like hour and fucking way up the side of the mountain. Have you been out to the actual, the Lucier mm. ones? The Did Lucier you go to those spa that's out there yeah, in the I mountain? Went, I, Not the spa, the, the... Yeah, I was right on the river. Yeah. In a little rock. The, I was in a rock pool. Yeah. With, like, there was, up, like, you got a hike up in there yeah, or something? Yeah, yeah. You went to that? Yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah. So it was like, yeah, it was like, I want to say it was like 40 minutes south of Invermere. And then you like turn off and then the, the, like in the winter, it was winter and it just snowed. Like when we drove out there fucking Saturday, we were driving out there in a fucking blizzard. Wow. Hold on. I was in, we were in the trucks, not too bad. Threw so in four, four high and just go slow. But it took us a long time to get out there because yeah. it was snowing hard. Yeah. So the next day you go up the mountain, that fucking, that's a sketchy, like it seems okay for the first like 14 kilometers and it's like 18 kilometers in down this gravel mountain road. But the last, like, four kilometers are fucking sketchy. At least it was fucking freaking. Really? Oh, yeah, man. Like, you're way up in the side. If you go over that fucking hill, that's it. And you're going down, like, a mile. Toppling and fucking twisting down into the river down below. Then you twist down around there, and then you still got to go down another. It's got to be a mile down to the mile walk down to the. Is there signs and stuff? Like Yeah, there's signs, a little change room and toilet. Park, really? Parking lot, little walkway with the thing. It's not government there. though, is it? Like I think it's in a state or? park. What, the provincial park, you mean? Right. Yeah. <laughs> Ouch. You want to be down so so bad. <laughs> One day. <laughs> um, <clears throat> um yeah. Yeah, so it's in a little park, so there's a little bathrooms there, but it's fucking cold, bro. It was like minus 17, minus 16. And then you jump in the hot springs? Like? Oh, the hot springs are beautiful, but you're a mile from the truck. Down this fucking... A mi- literally a mile? Yeah, a kilometer and a half. So then you I get, just say mile okay, because so most of our listeners right near are fucking... The, the washroom right. is right near the uh, springs then? So you... No, it's at the top of the hill by where you park. Really? So, so you, you get change down. and then you walk an hour and a half in well, so minus I 17? Like, I had or my not, pajama pants enough. on yeah. and my big boots. And then I just had my uh, my robe. I didn't use my robe though, actually. I, used my, I just wore my jacket. So I had my jacket, my pajama pants... A towel. And I was like, fuck it. So I went down there and I'm like, oh, there's a bunch of people down there already. There's two pools. There's a super hot pool and a not so hot pool, but they're both pretty fucking hot. And then the other pools start to get pretty cold as you get closer to the river. And uh, yeah, I just fucking went for it. 
it's fucking cold, so you just there in your fucking swim trunks. Fucking minus 17, you hop in the pool, it's beauty. Except you got rashes. Yeah, I did get a bit of a rash, but I, uh, my skin feels good. I think it's just, I don't know. Yeah, I did get a rash. My skin feels good, except for those little red bumps on it. Super stinky, too, the water. Is it sulfury? Yeah, yeah big yeah. time. There's shit floating around in it. We should ask our next guest that we're having on tonight about that, because he's into all that And all, stuff. My, all your jewelry turns fucking gold. And then, like, purple and all these weird colors. Huh. Even my silver ring turned, it looked like it was solid gold. And that it means slow, it's not real silver. Slowly change back. Does it? I'm just joking. Luckily, the wife's ring was good. Her white <laughs> ring. <laughs> yeah. I, like, exactly. <laughs> I think it's because it's silver and not white gold. If it was white gold, I think it, well, maybe it's not real silver. I don't know, but it don't rust, so yeah. I won't complain. Yeah. But it was a good little trip. Nice. Nice little fucking. Where'd you stay then? In, in then you had, Yeah. Then you yeah. had to hike up the hill after. So I just like hiked up the hill in my shorts. With my jacket on and my just legs exposed, walking then, up after being that? like, by the time I got up the hill, my like all my were legs, numb and all my leg hairs were like frozen to ice because they were wet and like yeah. yeah. Did you do the Wim Hof breathing to get rid of I it? I tried. Did you? Did, no, you? did you try? Just, well, yeah. it probably helped. Huh? <laughs> I did, <laughs> I did, did like that. No, I didn't know. I was well, thinking you do about long, how I, deep yeah, breaths. I know. I don't know. Man. I don't know it well enough to. No, not even Wim Hof wise. Just like <sighs> it's pretty cold. If you if you. Take the time to deep breathe. You can't. You can't shiver. So we scrambled up the side of the mountain and fucking back to the truck. Nice. It's good though. It's a nice little trip. Right on. Come back. Had the podcast and work. Yeah. Right on. What do you want to do next? I got the UFO quote. What else you got? Ah, let's just get that over. Down a gram, going deep. It's a profound UFO quote of a week. Words to ponder and critique. It's a profound UFO quote of a week. So, I have a CIA.gov, wow. uh, the reading room one, but I also have a backup. Do the backup. Can I just quickly describe what the Fine. other one is? No, no, I, no, I'll, I'll do the backup. I uh, <clears throat> Actually, now I can't even find that one, to be honest with you. Wow, I think I just lost it anyways. The backup, anyways. Hmm. It's cultural appropriation. Oh, so anyways, no, it was uh, Cleveland, uh, Ohio. If you see an identified flying object, land here, dial CD, and it's a, it's a, it's a sanitized approved for, for release from the CIA. I was going to read that. But I think I've got another quote in um, in uh, celebration of our. I think we. I don't know if it's going to ever come out or if. Uh, but we were on skeptical with Alex talking about uh, John Alexander's interview with him. A bit of it. I listened to the show today. Did, oh, it, oh, he brought it up already. Just a bit. There was only a little snippet. So of the, us. Yeah, there might be. A, I think he probably added it to a little snippet. But anyways, yeah. I've got a quote from John. Oh, with it then? The undeniable reality is that there are a substantial number of multi-sensor UFO cases backed by thousands of credible witnesses. In the physical domain, there are many photos, videos, radar tracking, satellite sensor reports, landing traces, including depressions and anomalous residual radiation, electromagnetic interference, residual? and confirmed <laughs> physiological effects. Personal observations have been made both day and night and often under excellent visibility with some at close range. Included are reports from multiple independent witnesses to the same event. Psychological testing of some observers has confirmed they're mentally competent. Why is none of this considered evidence? That's actually one of my big questions. It's one of my favorite questions in that. There you have it. That's it? Yeah. That's pretty anticlimactic. And that's John B. Alexander, PhD. The shill. The warrior monk. Warrior monk. <laughs> Ex-Green Beret, PhD. Tall Taylor. Master of strain. <laughs> <laughs> Government cover-up denier. <laughs> there you go. What else did you have? Do you have something else? Too late. That's it. Bingo, bingo, social media jingle. 
Don't forget to rate, comment, and Nothing at the go P.O. Box. To the America. New P -p 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 Box. Letter. <laughs> B -b -b bingo, bingo. Social media jingle. Don't okay, and to the social medias. When was the last time I did this? For what it's worth, the whole fetus with gills thing is heavily debunked by Crow Triple Seven. <laughs> Doctored x rays to support Darwinism. Apparently. Wow, wow. I, uh. Huh. We should learn more about that. I should. I asked him if he had any sources besides <laughs> Crow Triple Seven, because I know Crow Triple Seven. <laughs> but, uh, interesting. Anyway, I told him to send me any info he can find. I've never heard that one, but I'd like to look more into it, because that would be a problem. Yep. Now we got Bless Up, boys. Can you guess who sent that? You said that, you read the Bless Up last time. Is there is that on every video, the Bless Up? on every single video. Oh, that's right, yeah. It's Coop. Oh, hey, Coop, thanks. Yeah. Yes, thank you very much on the Joseph P. Farrell. Oh, good. People get excited when Joseph. Oh, I got some Joseph. We got good day from a very frozen PEI. I also found you via THC. Looking forward to hearing more. JPF is a joke like 99% of the alternative news clowns. At least he opened with a true statement. I don't really know what's going on there. He should stick to being a theologian. <laughs> Who's that from? That's from uh, Jiffix Dog 07. I knew nothing about this guy, but Def picked up on this. After the episode, girl, Google confirmed your sentiments. And now mine. Kind of new to Grammarica and very grateful for the episode 209 recommendation. Alan motherfucking green. Oh, and Felix killed it with that outro song. I got some more feedback of somebody that found Alan Green as well and found us recently. I'm not done yet, so you can wait your motherfucking turn. Okay. Well. <laughs> Thanks, guys. I happen to like Dr. Farrell. I thought Friday would never get here. Original Larry. It's quite the prolific uh, commenter. If people haven't figured out by now, either emailing Graham or commenting on YouTube are really your best shots at getting it read on the show. One of my favorite thing about interviews with Farrell is when he snaps that Zippo open every 25 minutes or so to fire up that TaylorMade. It makes me feel like I'm back at my nan's house listening to old family tales. I got some uh, feedback from Instagram here on the Joseph P. Farrell one. Nice one, guys. Ain't listened yet, but sure it'll be good. Can't wait to listen to this one. You guys are always great. I really enjoyed this one. I may get lost down a German Nazi research rabbit hole. And what a great listen. And oh, sick. I'm super excited. And then great app. Thanks for your feedback on Instagram, everybody. I, could, I should just read the people. That was Connor Russin, Bocephus Weirdness, Candley 13, Walking Muppets, Mystery of Psychonauts, and Fires in the Sky. Um, what was I going to say? So I wonder why there's a real hater there against alternative media, like somebody like Joseph Farrell. I mean, he's pretty factual as far as, and he, he's, he just says when he's going to speculate. So yeah. I'd really be interested in more learning more about why somebody I'd thinks be more interested he's in why like they're it. watching all our videos. <laughs> they think that all the people we're interviewing are fucking clowns. But especially Farrell, like he's. Maybe he just really likes Graham. Well, what did he... Uh, let's not get into let's, it. Let's not get into right. it. We've already spent too much time on it. Okay, you got buddy. anything else before we wrap it up? Uh, stuff I can save for uh, next time. Well, we got time. One more. Uh, sure. Oh, I got a great little UFO experience. Ooh. And it just came in. Perfect. And now another edition of Grind American Goodies by the people. This is from N. Poe. He says, I'm a recent listener, even more recent subscriber. Thank you for subscribing. Actually, you know what? Just a quick break here. We should tell people, is there other ways to subscribe? Like YouTube is a good way, right? 
Facebook, like it's for actually, so, like there's different yeah, ways to you, subscribe. I mean, right? honestly, you might as well, you should go subscribe on YouTube, whether you're going to watch the videos or not, just because I think it's good for something. Good for some algorithm somewhere. Yeah, it's good, good, for good for getting something. us kicked off YouTube sooner than we. Yeah, want to exactly. Be. So we can figure we can get demonetized. Oh yeah, we don't give a fuck about getting demonetized. We're already demonetized. <laughs> <laughs> We're working on slowly remonetizing. Um, but then subscribing, he could also mean subscribing via podcast player, right? Like iTunes, and then he could mean subscribing uh, to our monthly donations. That's kind of a way, right? That's right. And and YouTube and iTunes. That's and what Stitcher I just said. probably. That's what I just said, yeah. yeah. I, and I don't know I don't know, really still don't know if Android has its own version of I'm really kind of behind the times on where uh, if Android has something yet. Like an iTunes equivalent. Yeah, there's something I'm trying or, to think. Or are Android phones still just pulling from those platforms. I don't get yeah. pulling from iTunes. Yeah. You have to submit to each one. Shit, I should email Rob actually and ask him that. Yeah. Anyways, Anywho. I'll continue on here. I don't know if this is what you guys are looking for, but here's my recount of the first UFO I saw. Anyways, here it goes. A day vexed with possibility, the sky gray and bland. I stayed home from sick from school sick that day. I slumbered on my couch, tending to my dogs relentlessly, barking and pawing at the sliding screen door to the backyard. I finally obliged them. They ran straight out to the fence and sat staring at the sky. Silence. When I was young, my brothers and I made home movies. We had video cameras laying around the house. This I remembered when I peered out the door and saw it. A long black cigar-shaped craft floating 100 meters above the ground. It was made of segments of equilateral triangles arranged in a crystal-like turd. It floated above the, it floated above the tree line without an echo or noise. I ran to the hutch behind me. I knew we kept a digital camcorder there. Ran back to the door. I peered out and saw the craft was still moving slowly. With the camera on, I pointed it at the craft and pressed record. The camera then began to zoom in all the way without the touch of a button. It zoomed in so far I couldn't see the object. The camera then began changing filters to sepia, then black and white. I put the camera down, and when I looked up again, it was gone. This was my first UFO experience at age 10. I'm now 25, and it was that moment that indicated to me, or indicted me, or inducted me into the world of UFOs. Third time's charm. Well, he didn't spell it right. I'm just making, it could be any one of those three. How did he spell it? Indicted. Hmm. Indicted. Yeah. The world of UFOs, science, reality of nature, nature of reality, and foil hat <laughs> endeavors. As whimsical as I have written this, it is as true as I can be. On a semi-related note, I live within 12 miles of a very prominent Air Force base. Any thoughts? Anyways, big fan of your show. Keep up the good work. It's shows like yours, the conspiracy and occult junkies like me, myself, crave. Thanks for reading. Pew, pew. Good one, eh? Absolutely. Well written. Very well written. Still a poor reading, but it was well no, written. It's okay. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. So that should be it, I think, eh? So do you have any thoughts on that UFO? At first, I thought like weather balloon or kite with the equilateral triangles in there, but I don't know. The messing up the video camera seems strange, but I mean, obviously, it could be black project stuff if it's so close to an airbase. Yeah, that's right. It's hard to ignore that possibility. It's always black budget stuff, I think, isn't it? Most of the time. Black projects, yeah. And black budget. One of the two. I think that's about it, eh? Yep. All right. Well, uh, all right. I'll play us out with a little jingle. Get out a pen and paper and enjoy the chat with down. Lynn McTaggart. Why don't you send some physical mail to the Grimerica show at P.O. Box 16033. Next line. Uh huh. 
100-815, comma, 17th Avenue, SW. Next line. Uh-huh. Calgary, Alberta. Next line. Uh-huh. Canada. Next line. Uh-huh. T2T, space, 5H7. That's the P.O. box. Why don't you send Darren some dirty socks? Cause he's got a dirty sock fetish. Uh-huh. Why don't you send Graham some gold bullion? Cause he's got a gold bullion fetish. Uh-huh. Send him some gold. Send him some gold. Send him some gold in the P.O. box. A P.O. box. P.O. box. A gift physical. A gift physical. A gift physical. A gift physical. Everybody loves to give physical and give physical mail in the mailbox. So send him. Send him some mail. Send him some mail. Send him some mail. We're very excited today to have Lynn McTaggart with us. Um, most of you will know her from authoring The Field and The Intention Experiment and The Bond. And she's got a new book out called The Power of Eight. She's the architect of The Intention Experiment, which was like a global la- laboratory involving thousands of her readers testing the group uh, power of group thoughts and intentions around the world. And she's also a co-founder and editor of What Doctors Don't Tell You. So what a fascinating book, Lynn. We just, I just finished reading it a couple of days ago and thanks for uh, joining us here. Great. It's my pleasure. Yeah. My friend and I, uh, my friend, Adam, uh, he's got his little podcast called friends to know. We were talking about the power of eight, um, and, uh, and, um, about, what was I going to say about Adam and the synchronicity there about, um, the field changed our lives. Like but probably about a decade ago, I was reading the field, the intention experiment and Andrew Newberg's uh, work on mindfulness, uh-huh. which is interesting because you actually included that in the power of eight and Adam and I both like the field both changed both of our lives. So I guess I kind of wanted to start with, with that because this is going back now, probably a decade and just sure. maybe just a quick, a quick, uh, brief summary about, um, you know, that the beginning, the start of this whole thing. Sure. You mean the start of the whole thing for me? Yeah, I guess. And the field and, and, um, you know, cause the power of eight's a great summary and it kind of wraps the whole intention thing up. So maybe just the, the genesis of that. Okay. Well, what happened is, um, way back in the 1990s, um, because I'm editor of a magazine called what doctors don't tell you, I kept coming across these studies of things like spiritual healing and acupuncture, Uh, demonstrating uh, that this stuff works. And I kept thinking to myself, well, if that's the case, then that in itself undermines everything we think about how the world works. If you can have a thought and send it to someone else and make them better, that just really explodes our notion of how things work. So I wanted to find out why. Mm -hmm. It was just curiosity. Um, So I persuaded my publishers uh, in the UK and the US to let me go on a journey without a compass. I really did not know what I was looking for. But I thought, I'm going to talk to a lot of frontier scientists who are working in consciousness research, and they'll probably tell me that there are human energy fields there, and I'll write it up, and that'll be it. And, you know, um, hand it in, and that'll be done. And what I didn't count on was the different scientists all discovering one little aspect of what compounds into a completely new view of the world. So, and the other issue with scientists is that they don't like to speculate. You know, they think in math. 
right? Yeah. And they don't they don't like to speak in real English, and they also don't like to speculate. They don't like to move beyond their own experimental boundaries and sort of say, what does this mean? They're very cautious about that. So I realized after a while that this was going to have to be my job. And um, I didn't really know much about quantum physics, so I needed to study an awful lot about that too. And um, so I put all of that together into this new view of the world. And, you know, I was very careful about it. I read a lot of scientific evidence, which I I can read, because mm-hmm. uh, that's what I do all the time with what doctors don't tell you. And spent hours and hours and hours with these scientists, essentially being tutored in, in this new science. So what that demonstrated essentially is that we are not individual self-contained things operating according to fixed laws in time and space, the way that Newton describes us. We're much more vibrating packets of energy that trade energy and information with other vibrating packets of information. And there was all sorts of information in the field about how our thoughts are not locked inside our heads and that our brains are much more like a television station and a television set all in the same thing. We're transmitters and receivers rather than repositories of information. And then there was lots of other information too that I talked about that the primary mechanism of communication in the body is not chemistry as we've been told or even electricity, but frequency Hmm. and quantum frequency. And so all of that stuff really, really gives us a very new idea about the world. But one of the biggest things that I could not understand and that I needed to investigate was a bit of evidence that these scientists were discovering that thoughts are an actual something with the capacity to uh, change physical matter. And I wanted to find out how far we can take this. You know, uh, ultimately, in, in, in my background is that of an investigative reporter. So I've got that reporter's kind of skeptical mindset that I still bring to all of this work, no matter how interested I am in it now. But so I wanted to, I thought to myself, well, how far we can we take this? You know, what are we talking about here? Are we talking about just moving a quantum particle over a little fraction? Or are we talking about curing cancer? You know, what can we do with our thoughts? What practical thing can we do together? And also, uh, what happens when lots of people are thinking the same thought at the same time? Does that magnify the effect? So that's really what I was looking to find out with the intention experiment. So I thought to myself, you know, by that time, the field was in 30 languages. So I figured, well, I have a lot of readers out there. And I also have you know, a lot of contacts among the scientific community, the people working in this area. And if I just put them together and put these in experiments on the internet, I'd have the largest global laboratory in the world. And so that's really what I did. I wanted to put intention to the ultimate test. So every so often, starting from 2007, I would set up an experiment with one of these scientists who would set up a you know, a very, very detailed experiment in some laboratory. And, um, and we would then, and very controlled experiment. And then I'd invite my readers uh, around the world to come onto my internet site, or I would do it with an actual audience if I was speaking somewhere. And we would, you know, we started out small, trying to affect little leaves and seeds and things like that. And then the, the experiments grew in complexity over time. Then we started doing, trying to make water purified. We did loads of water experiments. And then we, we tried to lower violence in war-torn areas and then even did a healing experiment. Yeah. And I was really skeptical. I put in all kinds of qualifiers in my book, The Intention Experiment, which summarized all the evidence about intention, <clears throat> but also invited my readers to be part of this ongoing experiment. And I said in there, listen, it's only important to ask the question, you know, it's okay if it doesn't work, you know, and um, it worked, you know, it really worked. 
I mean, of the 30 experiments we've run to date, 26 have shown measurable, positive, mostly significant effects. Um, but And so that blew my mind, but it wasn't really the reason I wrote The, the Power of Eight. I mean, the reason I wrote The Power of Eight was my discovery, to my astonishment, that there were rebound effects happening with the participants, and there were also enormous effects happening in small groups when I started playing around with this with groups of eight. Mm -hmm. What sort of effects? Well, the eight thing really came about essentially by accident because um, I was trying to figure out how to run a workshop back in 2008. You know, I'd run a number of these intention experiments. They'd worked. And I thought to myself, well, I suppose I ought to run workshops. That's what people in this kind of position do. But I hadn't run many of them before, so I didn't really know what I was doing. Um, and I was sitting around with my husband one day talking about what we should do. And I said, well, I don't know. I'll just put them in groups of eight or so, and I'll have them send healing intention to each other. And he's a great headline writer. He's a journalist as well. And he said, yeah, the power of eight. I really love that. And that was essentially what happened. We ran our first uh, workshop in Chicago, um, and we put people into groups of eight. And I started telling them things like, you know, well, all hold hands, and it's got to be all the same intention exper- a, a statement. And I'm I'm completely making this up as I'm going along. I mean, I I had a very firm notion of how you do intention after working with a number of intention masters and also looking at what worked in the laboratory. And I had distilled all of that into a simple program called powering up that I have in the intention experiment, which shows you the, you know, the most effective way to do intention based on all of that. Um, But I wasn't sure how to do these group things, certainly in small groups. So as I say, I'm making it up as I go along. I'm figuring that the next day when they come back, they're going to tell us that they feel a bit more relaxed or it was very, you know, soothing or something like having a facial. What I didn't expect is what happened. They came back the next day. The people who had had the intention, who were the intention subjects of their groups, stood up and gave them a mic and turn, and they said stuff like this. I've had terrible knee arthritis, and my knee is feeling normal today. I had awful headaches, and I've had them for years and years and years, and my head is clear today. Um, I have terrible IBS, and my stomach feels normal, and have you know it's it's acted normally today, and you know, and on and on and on it went for an hour, and I was just I just sat there with my mouth open as did Brian, my husband, and we just figured this was a placebo effect, you know, and we kind of discounted it as that people wanted to feel better, et cetera. But I started, continue to run these workshops and more or less put people in groups almost as a a way to study them. And in every workshop I did, we had these amazing healings. You know, we had a woman with MS who showed up the next day without her, her crutches. We had a woman with cataracts who said her eye was 80% better we had a woman who'd had a stroke who couldn't focus her eyes when she was, you know, first in the group. And then her eyes were focusing normally right after in the intention group. And, you know, so it went on and on. People with crippling arthritis who would walk normally the next day. It was just, you know, the lame were walking. It was just shocking to me. So, and the other thing that was shocking to me, they kind of discounted a placebo effect is that, the senders were getting better too. Lots of them were reporting amazing rebound effects. And that was the same thing that happened with the big experiments. Um, You know, I was kind of shocked by all of what was going on in the workshops, but I kept kind of discounting it or wanting to try to figure out why and just didn't completely believe it. But then when I started running peace intention experiments, um, a little after this, I ran our first one in Sri Lanka. And, you know, we've had a number of really interesting effects with these peace experiments. I mean, the Sri Lanka experiment, um, it turned out we ran it over eight days. So people came together every day on my website for eight days and sent 10 minutes of intention. And what happened was really bizarre. 
violence actually quadrupled during that week and then plummeted. But wasn't that wasn't even the interesting thing that happened. And we, we you know, we had a scientist who isn't a professor of statistics study the numbers for injuries and deaths from two years before to a number of months afterward. And certainly we bucked the trend. Um, violence had been going up before our experiment. And then after our little peak in our during our week, it then plummeted and stayed lower than it had been for years. But that wasn't even the interesting part of it. The interesting thing was that during the week, uh, the government of Sri Lanka, which, who had been, which had been losing this war against the rebel forces, uh, which oct- occupied, they occupied the entire north of the country. They won, the government won a few decisive battles, and that allowed them to turn around the entire course of the war. Um, and that they were able to reclaim the north within a few months, and a few months after that, that war was over. And it ended in a nasty, bloody finish, but it ended, and it's now a peaceful country. Um, you know, did we do this? Who knows? You know, short answer, who knows? There's lots of variables. But when you keep running peace experiments and they all keep showing a lowering of violence or a big change, then it starts becoming interesting, which is what we've been doing. But that isn't even the interesting part of the story. The interesting part of the story is what happened to my participants who I had surveyed. I had about 15,000 people um, participating in this experiment. And I surveyed them afterward, mainly to find out if how it worked for them. How, you know, was it, was it, uh, first of all, were they able to get on the internet site? We'd had some issues with lots and lots of people coming on the same site at the same moment in our early experiments. So I wanted to check that out and find out how it was for them. And I got back uh, messages like this on the survey. Um, I felt like I was wired to a higher network. Um, I was trembling and shaking and sobbing through the whole thing. And we had loads and loads of people who were sobbing uncontrollably. Um, People felt incredible energy. Somebody felt like they were in the tractor beam of Star Trek. Um, They had goosebumps coming up and down their arms. They were just extraordinary things. People were describing essentially a mystical experience. Um, And that was one thing. The other thing that was shocking to me was that they were also describing an enhanced sense of peace in their own life. They were making up with estranged partners and family members. They were getting along better with coworkers and even not so nice bosses. They were, um, they were in love with everyone they came into contact with. Something like 40, 40% or more were saying they were in love with strangers. I mean, you know, they were hugging strangers. It was just unbelievable. And so this is where I started seeing, and this was the case over and over again, that there was some sort of weird mirror effect going on with these big experiments, large and small, and that whether you were the sender or the receiver in the case of the small studies and the small small power bait groups, didn't matter. Being part of this essentially group prayer was healing for everyone involved. <laughs> It, it really made me think of um, 12 step groups and that maybe that's part of what's happening there because, uh, you know, the, there's a group intention and they, the, one of the goals is obviously helping, helping others. So there's that altruistic part of it. And there is sort of a, you know, a prayer meditation part of it as well in a group of people. And I thought maybe that's part of what's happening and how people are, are healing through, you know, 12 step work as well. Yes, it could well be. I think there's a real powerful thing with groups, but there's something about, you know, what I was trying to figure out was why. And that's really why I wrote The Power of Eight, because, you know, for many years, I buried the lead of the story, as any journalist (laughs) can tell you. I just did not want to deal with this. I wasn't sure what I was dealing with. I had, I would run it and I would run it in a conference or whatever, and people would come up to me, um, friends of mine and say, I'd like to do that in my groups. And I say, no, because we don't know what this is. We don't know what we're dealing with here. Um, I need to understand this more. You know, we're talking about people's lives and healing, et cetera. Um, But what I concluded looking at it from every possible way is that 
there is the big group experience, something about doing something together as a group, particularly an altruistic something, is unbelievably transformational. Um, and altruism is a big, big factor of this. Um, when I started looking at the, al- the, the, the work on altruism, I saw it was like a bulletproof vest. You know, when you look at the studies on al- altruism, people who give to other people in any regard, any way, even the smallest way, are happier, healthier, live longer. And a really interesting study I came across was done by a psychologist priest who, you know, he was both. And he wanted to see if prayer could help mental illness. You know, certainly there's plenty of studies looking at prayer and physical illness. So he recruited some 400 people with depression and he put them into two groups. One group were the people who got the prayer and the other group were the people who conducted the prayer. They were praying for the others. And afterward, he calculated how well they they were and, you know, whether there was any improvement. And he found that the people who had received the prayer did better. You know, they were better, but not as better as the group who had done the praying. So he was kind of shocked by that and said, it seems, you know, the praying is better for you than being prayed for. Um, And, you know, that has that has shown itself to be the case over and over again in so many studies. Well, I like how you went back to the, to some ancient roots as well, like ancient roots to religion, like taking out the, the institutionalization of it and the core, some of the core principles there. And you went back and looked at, you know, is is there a, is there a beginning there as well with, with groups of people praying and and healing? Well, this was the thing I, you know, one of the things that, that bothered me a lot was, I said to myself, you know, I just stumbled on this. I couldn't have been the first person who thought of this. You know, there must be something somewhere. And I started speaking to all kinds of experts in esoteric uh, practices, in indigenous practices, in religious practices with healing. And I found plenty of evidence, of course, for prayer groups. You know, they're in every religion, um, from minions in the Jewish religion Teresa de Avila, the St. Teresa, is the first person credited with doing Catholic prayer groups. And, you know, there are prayer groups all around the place, and there still are today. What I couldn't find, what no one, no expert had ever heard of, were these rebound effects occurring, or the idea of everyone praying together as one. So I kept looking and looking, and, you know, I found some, some connections with mystical Christianity and the Rosicrucians, but still didn't find what, what was happening in my groups until I came across uh, a, uh, a sermon by a preacher from, by a, a Protestant minister from the early part of the 20th century. And he had written about the fact that there was a mistranslation in the Bible that the Bible um, talked about in the area of the Bible called the Acts, which is all about the apostles that's, you know, when they were setting up the the church after Jesus supposedly ascended. And he, you know, he had instructed them in what to do, and they were starting to carry it out. And it always talks about how Jesus told the apostles to pray with one accord. That's the translation in the King James Version of the Bible, which is the Bible we all know. Um, But what this minister was saying was that this is a terrible mistranslation, that the the original, which was the word in the Hellenic Greek, the Bible was written in Hellenic Greek, everybody agrees on. That original word was a word homothumidon. Now that is a word that means something much bigger than with one accord. It's a musical term, it's an adverb, and it means passionately with one voice. So it's like, think of a Beethoven symphony with all of those individual instruments coming together for this amazing collective sound. That's really what it was. It was all about how you should pray passionately together with one voice. And that just blew my mind because that was exactly what our groups do. Mm -hmm. And what was really fascinating to me was that 
in the Acts over and over, it talks about you do this and you will be healed. You can heal. This is a, Jesus constantly told them to heal as a group, heal together. And when they first set up the church, they had everyone pray. They had about 120 people there and they had them pray as one. So I started thinking, well, maybe there was something to this. Maybe that was the key about why the apostles were able to heal as part of it was this group thing that really amplified their ability. And I started also thinking that maybe it was really important that they have a certain number because one of the first things they did was replace the 12th. Judas had hung himself after betraying Jesus, and they replaced him with someone who had not been around when Jesus was there. But nevertheless, it was somehow important to have 12. And people always assume that stood for the 12 tribes of Israel, but maybe there was something else important in the group effect that they felt needed a, a, a 12th member. Is there... Have you noticed a yang to that or a ying or whatever the dark side of that would be? Because, I mean, if if groupthink seems to be real dangerous in a lot of ways, too. So I wonder if that's like uh, some sort of cause of it is just, you know, malevolent. It can work malevolently and benevolently. Of course it can. I mean, there is, you know, intention doesn't have a morality. If you want to use it for negative effect you can there's plenty of evidence in it i go all i go into it in the intention experiment in great detail Mm. you know there are many there are plenty of the lab studies showing that people sending intention to stunt a plant's growth can do so there's certainly plenty of studies of qigong masters you know the kind of people who can use their intention to throw somebody across the room they use destroying mind to affect their opponents negatively You know, you can do that. And of course, we have plenty of evidence in Hitler. What was, you know, Nazi Germany, but a group intention led by one very charismatic person. And that essentially led a whole country, in effect, into evil. So, yeah, we can. Luckily, people who do evil don't ordinarily assemble a group and have a very focused intention. And that's part of it, too, is very focused mind, very specific intentions tend to work best. And luckily, you know, most people who want to do malevolent things are not that focused, not that, you know, they there's a crazy with a gun who walks into a high school yeah. like we just saw. Yeah. Yeah. The other interesting part is how you mentioned the self-help industry and the self-help you know the 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 danger of thinking too much about yourself uh and you know using your your own intentions like that because you you figure the real healing comes from you know uh, healing healing others or thinking about others but i guess there's also there's also a fine line there as well because a lot of people come from you know codependency and they've been thinking about others too much like there's a there's got to be a a negative to to people pleasing and the codependency part. So I guess it's it seems to me like there's a fine line between, you know, working on yourself enough to have the mindfulness or whatever to to help other people. Do you, do you understand what I mean? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> what was really interesting to me was what happened with people in my master class because. In order to understand this and what was exactly going on, I decided in 2015 to to I I had run master classes before that in intention, which were six week courses uh, where I would just teach people all the rudimentaries of intention as I understood them. And I had practiced and I had seen many intention masters practice. Um, But I decided that year to put people into groups for an entire year and to study exactly what was going on with them Mm -hmm. Uh, month after month after month. They would be my own Petri dish. So I got together about 250 people. They went through the course of six weeks. Then I put them into groups. And, And I, as I say, I carefully monitored what was going on with each of them, with their health, their career, their relationships, and their life purpose. Now, it was extraordinary because we had some amazing healings. I mean, we were, people were really transforming before my eyes. I mean, we had a guy who was a clinical psychologist to his chagrin. He, he suffered from lifelong 
depression, ser- you know, serious depression, sometimes suicidal. And that's not a good fit for a clinical psychologist. He had tried everything. He was using, you know, all kinds of integrative stuff. Nothing was working for him. So with his group, he asked for, he asked the, that they have a hold an intention for him to uh, find the cause of his problem. Soon after that, he found that one of his liver filtration systems wasn't working. And as soon as that was fixed, and, and that was the cause because it was called, causing all kinds of toxins to go to his brain. As soon as that was fixed, his depression lifted. There was another woman with 15 years of chronic fatigue who um, could barely exercise for no more than about five minutes. And she was given uh, also by her group, they sent an intention for her to find the cause of this. That's what she wanted because she had tried every alternative treatment and it wasn't working. And they found that she had black, she found soon after that she had black mold in her dressing room. And that was one of the main causes of it. And as soon as that was fixed and a few other things that she also discovered um, right after this intention, she's now lifting weights and going hiking. You know, and we have loads and loads of stories like that. Can... Um, but sometimes it didn't work. Just to answer your question, sometimes it didn't work. And so with one woman, Andy, um, it wasn't working for her. You know, she was trying to get, she was going through a divorce. She was trying to get a new uh, job, but she had, she needed the money and she had sold her gift shop and she just wasn't getting anything. She was trying everything and wasn't getting any leads. And her group kept sending different intention. And then we sent intention for her to go back to her seed moment. Did she feel any kind of scarcity that she wouldn't have enough money and all kinds of stuff like that? Nothing. Didn't work. So finally, I just said, Andy, get off of yourself, you know, start intending for someone else. And I had a someone else in mind because a stepfather had written in about his stepson who's 15 years old, Luke, who had broken up with his first serious girlfriend and in a fit of, you know, adolescent angst, he had thrown himself off a 40 foot structure onto hard ground. And he'd broken everything in his body, He had nerve damage, brain damage, and the doctors didn't think he was going to live. So we set up a healing vigil for Luke while his stepfather, this was all the master class, while the stepfather was re- having a running commentary about what was going on with him, with his, his son, uh, you know, and how he was responding. And I mean, it was amazing. Luke got out of the hospital in record time. You know, he was healed. Uh, Maybe it was good doctoring. Maybe it was us. Um, But it was incredible. He lived. He did really well. But what was really interesting to me is what happened to Andy. Because the moment Andy got off of herself and started intending for Luke, she gets a call out of the blue with a dream job. Mm. And that happened over and over again with loads and loads of people where as soon as they got off of themselves, extraordinary things happened in their lives. And that was one of the great things about the group is this whole thing of um, of the getting off of yourself, being able to be altruistic. And I found a real a study that really spoke to this when you asked me about self-help groups. Um, This study was trying to compare people who had lived the good life, you know, pleasure seekers who had, um, you know, they were living the dream. They had all the money in the world. They were traveling all the time. They were on holidays, et cetera. And when they looked at their immune systems, they were terrible. I mean, these are people who were people who were perfect candidates for diabetes, heart attacks, you know, you name it. They were going to drop like flies pretty soon. Then you had the other other people they were compared with who were not as affluent, but who were living a life of service. These people had incredibly robust immune systems. These guys were going to live forever. So I started thinking about the whole self-help movement and thought that in itself is really dangerous. Self-help. It really needs to be other help. And once you get off of yourself, that's when your life can start working. Yeah, it really makes you think of how important (laughs) service work is. You know, a lot of, you know, religions and 
and well, spiritual practices include service being so important and it's probably there's probably like a you know an unconscious or subconscious reason for that because it really does help well speaking of religion it makes you wonder can this sort of thing overrun free will like can you mentioned a high school shooter can that person is that person the does that person necessarily have to be you know, the cultivation of their own intentions or can they be the product of someone else's intentions? And, you know, it kind of slips into that whole MK Ultra sort of slope. Well, it can be the other, you know, the product of somebody else's intentions. That's what has always been with our groups. We also do on my website, I have, uh, and among my com- my e-community, we do an intention of the week. We do three of them every every week. We send intention to three people with health challenges, the whole community, at a certain time on Sundays. Nice. And, you know, it's, yeah, we've had some amazing, amazing feedback from them. Um, but I usually say, unless somebody's in a coma or they're a baby or something like that, they should give their permission. Um, But here's the interesting thing. It doesn't necessarily require belief, although that helps. Because Luke, look at Luke. Luke thought his parents, he did not believe in intention. He thought his parents' belief in the power of intention was stupid. Mm. So it doesn't require belief, but I think it requires permission, to be honest. Huh. So did you get, um, at the beginning of all this, when you're, cause you were very, you paid attention to the scientific protocols and you really made an effort to, to make this scientific. Was that, was that process frustrating at all that you even had to go through those hoops to, to prove to the scientific community that may, may never even, you know, agree or buy into it no matter what kind of evidence you had? Was that, was that frustrating? And then the other part of that would be, it seems like there's less um, of a need for that now, or, or you feel less of a need for that now. Is that because you've already made such, uh, you know, such headway through this whole thing that, or, or is the paradigm really changing? Well, first of all, there are lots of answers to that. First of all, I wasn't proving it to the scientific community because they won't believe it anyway. Right. I mean, the scientific community, science is not a science. It's a religion. And in the, in the main, and I certainly see this with medicine all the time, in the main, no matter what evidence you demonstrate to, to certain scientists, and medical scientists, they have a certain view of the world. And what they look for most of the time is confirmation of that view. Yeah. Um, the real explorers, the, the scientists, for instance, that I wrote about in the field, were they started out life as orthodox scientists, but then they found a square peg that didn't fit in their round hole of belief. And that changed, that allowed them to completely change what they thought about and how they, their, their paradigm then had to completely shift. And they believe like real explorers that you go with what you've got, even if it takes you to a place you didn't, you didn't expect or didn't particularly want to go to. So I was not, and I am not ever writing for the status quo. You know, I don't, I don't expect to change their minds. If I do change some people's minds, wonderful. Mm-hmm. But I don't yeah. expect to, I don't expect to, and not, nor do I seek to. Um, I was doing this for myself because I started out not believing it, and I continue to do it for myself. I still have that skeptical mindset in my core that needs to, to look at some of this evidence, or at least I did needs to look at that evidence over and over again, and then to see how far we can take this. That was really my question all the time. That's part of the reason we took baby steps. And, you know, I got fed up with those baby steps after a while and said, come on, let's do something huge. Let's lower violence in a, in a war, you know. But, um, but you yeah, know, I was doing that for myself. I think I like to continue doing evidence because it's probably what sets my work apart from the loads of other people out there who talk about, make claims about things with no necessarily, you know, with no evidence of it. And so I try to, in every regard, try to show, well, here, there's this evidence for it. I'm not just making this up. Um, But having said all of that, you know, I've teased this apart in every possible way. And what I've discovered is, yes, it's, you know, a brainwave resonance 
aspect of it. There's group effects, there's intention effects in that power, there's altruism, and then there's an X factor. And I've become a believer in the sense that I've seen this so much and I've understood that something about people coming together as a group and maybe just praying together is the way to explain it best is magical and transformational. Hmm. And there's an X factor that maybe we'll never understand. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and I really feel like the paradigm has shifted over the last 10 or 15 years. And, and this is just like I heard, you know, Alex on Skeptical and Gordon White talking about, are we winning? Like, I believe that we are, and your work has played a big part in that. Thank you very much. Well, you know, what I also wanted to look at was the brainwave situation going on. I mean, that was the final thing that we did that was a study. I mean, the studies are ongoing. We did a Middle Eastern experiment. We did an American peace intention experiment both this past autumn, and they carry, we carry on seeing how far we can take it and what happens to the people who are part of that. That interests me more now because I did a this study with Life University. This is the largest chiropractic university. I'd spoken there in 2015 and they offered to put their neuro, uh, neuroscience and psychology departments at my disposal nice. to do a series of studies. And I thought, wow, this is pretty fab. So um, we did a brainwave study where we just got recruits among the college students. Um, we did seven studies of this, looking at the brainwaves of one of the senders during these power bait groups. And we found some extraordinary evidence that as soon as people start doing this in a group, um, the parts of the brain that are involved with separating us out from the world, particularly the parietal lobes, which sit sort of toward the back of our heads on either side, um, those are involved in helping us orient through space. And they tell us what's our self and where we end and the rest of the universe begins. Well, that had turned way down. So had other parts of the brain that were sim- had similar um, uh, mechanisms and the frontal lobes of the brain that are involved in some executive fun- func- functions and also are involved in worry, doubt, negativity, all turned way down. What these were were brainwave signatures virtually identical to the brainwave signatures of Dr. Andrew Newberg when he studied people like Sufi masters in chanting Mm. and Buddhist monks in ecstatic prayer. These were people who were experiencing an ecstatic state of oneness, which is how they described it afterward, how they felt this amazing energy, they felt this electricity, they felt changed in many ways. You know, they had had some sort of amazing effect. And all of the characteristics of a, of a mystical experience, you know, this, this feeling of incredible connectedness, this energy, actual palpable energy, this uh, feeling of being in some sort of altered state of having a blinding epiphany of meaning, some suddenly the whole world makes sense to them. You know, they have a, a, an incredible understanding. And then finally, uh, a, a feeling of rejuvenation, you know, something big changes in their lives or their, their attitude changes in, in a huge way. All of these uh, things had happened to so many of our participants and they were recording that even in these, in these studies. Now, here was the interesting thing to me because most, uh, you know, the way you get to that state most of the time with other modalities is through years of study and practice. It takes years to become a Sufi master or a Buddhist monk. It takes years, it takes hours to get into that state. You have to do a lot of priming. My people during, you know, in in the main, you know, um, well, and particularly with this, this study, most of the, the young people had never meditated before. They certainly had done a, never done a power of eight group. They were all novices. And the only information they had about how to do it was a 13 minute video from me. That was it. Nevertheless, they were transported into this state in an instant. And so I really came to the realization that maybe these groups are a fast track to the miraculous. And also another realization 
you know, you don't need to do incredible deprivation like sweat lodges. You don't need to take ayahuasca. You know, you don't need to study many of these disciplines, although it might be nice, if you want this kind of effect. All you need is a group yeah. and a common intention. And how important do you think the music is a, a part of that? It, it really resonated with me because when you mentioned the song that Choku Ray by Jonathan Goldman, I remember where I was when I first heard that. It was, I was in Sedona at this crystal bowl store and there was an outside sculpture and it was playing that, that tape over and over. <laughs> and I really, I really resonated <laughs> with me and I was, we were playing that in, in the little group of people that I, I was with. So I wonder how important that is as well for, for some of that. That was a pretty powerful piece. Do you think? Okay. No, it's not important because in the study, we found that one of the areas that was turned way down was their, you know, their ability to, uh, uh, to, uh, their cognitive, uh, relationship with sound and sight. So that was another thing turned way down. So hmm. I, as I say in the book, that pretty much discounted the music as a factor. Also in my power of eight groups, meeting over the year, they didn't play music when they were doing intention together. And yet they had all of these transformational situations of the people in the groups who remained in groups during that year long study I did of them. Uh, there were 250 people to start and 150 people stayed in their groups, met every week of those 150 people, pretty much hundred percent of them had major life transformations in some way, wow. whether wow. that was healing or it was making up with family members they'd been estranged from, uh, or it was finding dream jobs, having incredible windfalls, you know, when they needed them. Uh, there was a woman down to her last 200 pounds, a Mar- uh, UK woman. And suddenly, out of nowhere, out of nowhere, she gets a, uh, a special scholarship from Lloyd's of London, having been an employee before that. She didn't know anything about this. It comes in just when she needed it. And that was the sort of thing that happened over and over and over again. And none of these people had music. So it's about the group effect. Do you, um, crap, I forget where I was going to go with that. I was, I was wondering, do you think that this is sort of this was all sort of happening, happening naturally, you know, before we sort of got, came out of hunter gatherer mode and we were stuck in these sort of groups of 150 or less. And, you know, uh, yeah, something that me and my, my wife discussed quite a bit is like the death of culture over in the Western world and how, you know, like you don't even, kind of- well, not only that, like even in a couple of generations, you've seen the death of like family gatherings and Thanksgiving and all these all these little sort of bigger nuclear groups where, you know, if mm-hmm. someone, if someone got sick, you're automatically doing all that. And it seems like we've all been yeah. isolated into these groups of five or 10 now. And, you know, even, even in that group of five or 10, everyone's so fucking busy that they don't even have time to, you know, half the time you can't even really all, all get together on the same page inside that group. Whereas, you know, a hundred years ago, you could all get together on Thanksgiving. And if, if grandma had a sore fucking leg, you know, everyone, everyone there is just naturally hoping that grandma's leg's going to get better and things like that. It's, you know, when my wife or someone gets sick in our house or gets the flu or something, you know, it's the natural instinct that everyone sort of wants them to get better. Sure. But that's different from getting together and, you know, in an organized fashion, sending an intention to that person all together, you are actually in some sort of resonant brain state. So I think, and heart state. So I think that's different. Um, Was it always there with hunter gatherers? We don't know. I mean, with the ax, looking at the only place where I found it thus far, I mean, somebody told me something about the Chinese doing something like this in ancient China. I'd like to look that up. I certainly wasn't able to find it with any of the the people that I'd, you know, the experts that I'd, I'd consulted who knew about all of these ancient healing traditions. Um, but Jesus was talking about this as though it were something revolutionary, like so much of what he talked about. I mean, he was a revolutionary, whether or not you believe that he was a religious figure, 
or just somebody who was a change maker. Um, he certainly was a huge change maker. He was a, a revolutionary. And he was talking to the apostles like they didn't know about this before, that this was really important to pray together. And they would say, oh, Lord, teach us how to pray. And this is what he said. Hmm. So before we, uh, before we run out of time here, I did want to ask you about the water part of this whole thing. I'm really fascinated by, you know, structured water and the memory of water and the, the healing properties. And, and, uh, and you did notice a difference. You did notice effects on water for sure, but there was also a difference between water and people, I believe. Um, yeah. Okay. So we did a whole series of experiments on water with different scientists we tried doing just very subtle things, measuring them with uh, with devices that measure um, our very subtle energetic systems with them. Um, we tried that at first, and we saw that we slightly changed the energetic footprint of bottle of tap water to look much more like bottled water. That was quite interesting. That was one of our first experiments. Then we moved on to trying to. I wanted to work with. We had been using uh, Dr. Konstantin Karatkov's GDV machine, which is like that measures essentially the aura of a human being or a, or a living thing, but also shows light going through water, which would any change in it would suggest a different in a difference in the collection of molecules of water. Water molecules, water is like nothing else in the world. Um, it's got all kinds of anomalies. And one of the weird things is the molecules of water don't stay static. You know, it's H2O, two hydrogen, one oxygen. They cluster together. Those little molecules cluster together like pieces of Lego. And that those Lego bonds constantly change. And so some of this very subtle equipment is looking at whether there are any changes in those bonds. They also, water also acts like a tape recorder. The molecules of water also polarize around any other particles and essentially tape record, to, to, for one of another phrase, they tape record that information. Um, so that's what we were looking for, because the theory is that that's, those changes in those molecular bonds are an in, indicative of whether or not the water is purer than, than, than it was or the that one sample is purer than another sample is. And so we tried it with that, the, the GDV machine. We then, I went to Penn State University to the world's water expert then, with the late Rustin Roy, and he and his lab team used a, a very sophisticated and well accepted among the orthodoxy piece of equipment, a Raman spectrometer. And this measures Essentially, it has is a very subtle mechanism that measures light going through water also. And we had a big effect there too. Um, and we tried a number of things. Then I wanted to try a, a real experiment, you know, in the field. So in 2010, Dr. Uh, Masaru Omoto invited me to be part of a, a big conference of his and to do an experiment on Lake Biwa, which is the most polluted, its largest and most polluted um, lake in Japan. So we did, we took two glasses of a sample of water, one was our control and one not, and we measured the pH, we changed it, moved it toward alkalinity, which is considered pure, by a whole pH. Mm -hmm. So we had an interesting ex experiment then, we showed a big response there and also with the GDV machine. Um, but the interesting thing about the experiment was when we were doing all these experiments that, and the ones we surveyed, we found there was no change in the people, um, you know, as there had been with people being involved with our peace experiments. I mean, they said it wasn't the same for them. They felt, you know, as though they felt, you know, well, maybe uh, pure, purifying water is possible. You know, they felt all these good ecological things about it, but they weren't emotionally changed in any way. They weren't, their lives didn't change. That way. rebound effect didn't <laughs> sound the same. No, they didn't have healing effects. Whereas, and what we found with the experiments too, is that 
there were mirror effects that that seemed to mirror the um, the intention. So if we were doing it, we did an intention for uh, a guy who had PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, a, a, a Gulf War veteran. And that was the one where I recorded the most healings among the participants. They were then writing and saying, my knee was killing me, not anymore. You know, I, I have this condition and it's completely gone now and I'm just feeling great. So I don't, I don't get my migraines anymore. I'm walking better, you know, just on and on. My hip doesn't bother me anymore. We were getting these incredible healings. So there seemed to require other human beings. Yeah. That's interesting. So before we let you go, I mean, reading your book really made me want to do my own, our own groups of power of eight here. I mean, maybe we should do that with the podcast or even in, in my personal life, like with, you know, my girlfriend and some other couples or something like that. But there is really, so I guess I want to give you the opportunity just to talk about, about that a little bit, because you give us instructions in your book on how to do that. And it doesn't really matter if you're uh, in person locally or online, it just works, right? Well, that's it. And I mean, that's why I wanted to really encourage people to be to create power of eight groups. Um, I have a uh, a part of my website, lynnmctaggart.com forward slash forum, where you can just set up a group or join a group of eight um, or more. People are setting up groups in different time zones all over the world on that forum. So People can do that and you can meet with them on Skype or Google Hangouts or Zoom. Um, also, I run a year-long masterclass. We just started ours now, our one for 2018. And I set people up with groups, as I mentioned earlier. Um, if you want to, in your own life, set up a Power of Eight group, you can do that. Um, we have a, um, I have some instructions. They're pretty simple. Of course, there's a lot of science behind it. There's some things to do with it, but the rudimentaries are get yourself a group. Um, there are certain good mind states and heart states, and I mention them in the book, the kind of ways to focus your mind and the best ways to state an intention are all there in the book. Um, one thing that I would suggest is you be specific. Um, at a group on my master class recently, one of the groups, they said, Oh, we're all intending for to win the lottery. And I said, why? And they said, well, Sophie over here needs money to more money for her child. And -and so-and-so over here needs more money to buy a car. And I said, well, why don't you just have an intention for Sophie to have the money that she needs and for Alan to have the money he needs for a car? You know, why don't you just do something really specific? So one of the things I always find is being specific is really, really important. So if you're doing a healing intention in your groups, it's, you know, our intention is that Jane Doe be free of all pain in her right toe, you know, or right right big toe or something like that, where it's really, really specific. Um, that's important. And, you know, sending it out from your heart. But I really encourage people, you know, definitely in the book, you'll find out all the instructions, definitely set up your own groups and find out, you know, how powerful you are in numbers. Yeah, for sure. So do do most groups rotate through and, and do intentions for each person in the group kind of thing? Well, they can do, they can really mix it up. I mean, you can do, you can do intentions for people outside the group, for people in the group. You can focus on one person for a while. You know, it all depends on what the group feels like. The only important point is just to do the intention together. That's awesome. Well, thank you so much for, uh, for coming on. It's just, I think your work is amazing and yeah, we're looking forward to trying some of this out. Great. Thanks so much. Take care. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. That was a chat with uh, the one and only Lynn McTaggart. And Grambo got up at 3 a.m. Yeah, I was a little rusty this morning. Mm-hmm. Start off slow. Well, it's about it's about 10 to 6 now. We're all wrapped up for the day. Yeah. Well, not wrapped up. Now we have to go yeah. to our day jobs. Yeah. Yeah, it was fun. That yeah, was a good was one. Good. Yeah. It's a pretty good book. And uh, it's very, very interesting. It does make me want to start up. Maybe we should start something up in, uh, you know, with... Uh, with the show, get people on it. Adam, I know Adam's into it already. In the chat, so yeah, just make yeah. a room, the intention room. 
That's not a bad idea. And you just throw up. You could be the intention or you just pick things. Yeah, I do want to try. I, I kind of want to try it. We like, intend for Graham to slip on the ice when he leaves the studio. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's what's going to happen. You yeah, better be careful. Exactly. So what else was I going to say about that? Yeah, very interesting, interesting work and interesting journey over the last decade. Absolutely. Lots of scientific evidence. And uh, yeah, I love it. She's been on the list for a while. Good one to finally cross off. Yeah. And uh, yeah, check out the book. Again, big thanks to Lynn for coming on the show, making some time. Big thanks to you guys for all tuning in and listening. Uh, if you can, head over to grimerica.ca slash support, guys. There's a bunch of different options there of how you can support the show. Keep us going. Keep us able to keep having these uh, uninterrupted and unedited and, um, yeah, nice open and fair conversations with these people. Yeah. So if you're getting any value from the show... And you'd like to send a little value back our way, guys, uh, do head over to grimerica.ca slash support and sign up today. Of course, you can do a one-time donation there just as well. And there's a whole list of things in every episode, show notes of things you can do to support the show that cost you absolutely nothing. Yeah, and I'll put a link to all the stuff we talked about in the show notes as well, like uh, Andrew Newberg's research in that book I was talking about and Marasudo Emoto and all that kind of stuff. Is Marasudo Emoto the one from the first, like... Yeah, that water stuff. Uh, freezing the water. With the bleep. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Yeah. yeah. Huh. Well, there you have it, guys. Thanks for getting up early with us. Big thanks to Lynn again. And, uh, yeah, I think that's about wraps it up, guys. Thanks for listening. And we will see you next week. Sweetheart.